بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم uh, Welcome to your first online lecture in neuroanatomy This lecture is presented by me, Dr. Maha Elbiltagi, Assistant Professor of Anatomy and Embryology, the University of Jordan. Uh, this lecture will focus on types of brain fibers, including anatomy of the basal ganglia and the internal capsule. Uh, so, fibers inside the brain are of two types, either white or gray matter. The white matter of the brain are occurring of three types, association, commissural, or projection fibers. The association fibers are connecting different areas in the same cerebral hemisphere. Commissural fibers are connecting the same areas on the opposite cerebral hemisphere. Projection fibers are the ascending or descending fibers to or from the cerebral cortex. Back to the association fibers, they are occurring in two forms inside the brain, according to the lens. They are either divided into short or long association fibers. The short association fibers connecting between adjacent gyri, for example, the pre-central and post-central gyrus of the brain. The pre-central gyrus is present in the frontal loop and post-central gyrus on the parietal loop. For example, also the superior and inferior parietal lobules on the parietal loop. So these fibers are in the form of U-shaped lines. The other form of the association fibers are the long association fibers. Inside the brain, we have four bundles. The first one is the superior longitudinal bundle. This bundle connecting the frontal, parietal, occipital, and also the temporal loops of the brain. This is the superior longitudinal bundle. The inferior longitudinal bundle runs from on the tentorial surface of the brain and connects between the temporal and occipital loops. Only the temporal and occipital loops of the brain. The other one is the cingulum. Cingulum, this bundle forms incomplete circle around the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum is this structure here which forms the largest commissural fibers of the brain. The cingulum forms incomplete circle, begins on the anterior part of the corpus callosum, which is this part, is called rostrum, and then runs upward to the genu, and then the body of the corpus callosum, and continues to reach a structure called ancus on the temporal pole of the brain. The cingulum is part of limbic loop of the brain, which runs on the medial surface. The last one is the uncinate fasciculus, which is this bundle here. The uncinate fasciculus, for, uh, it joins the frontal and temporal poles of the brain. The second type of the white matter inside the brain are the commissural fibers. We have many commissural fibers connecting the same areas on the opposite cerebral hemisphere. The most important of them, the anterior commissure. This structure here is the anterior commissure. The anterior commissure, it connects an area on the inferior surface of the brain called biriform fossa. This area is included in the pathway of smell sensation. The area is situated in the most anterior part between the temporal poles of the brain on the tentorial surface. The posterior commissure, the posterior commissure, to describe the posterior commissure, we first have to describe this structure here, which is called bineal gland. This structure, this rounded structure is called bineal gland. 
So the pineal gland or the pineal body is important for regulation of the dark, uh, dark light cycle of the body and of course regulation of sleep. The pineal gland lies between two stalks, the upper stalk and lower stalk, which is this part and this part. The upper stalk include something called habenular commissure. So this structure here, the round structure here by the blue color is called habenular commissure. Inside the habenular commissure between the two cerebral hemispheres, we find a nucleus called the habenular nuclei on both sides. These nuclei are important in the smell and other visceral sensations. In the lower pineal stalk, we find another commissure called <coughs> posterior commissure. So this structure here is the posterior commissure. The posterior commissure is important for pupillary light reflex. The pupillary light reflex means constriction of the pupil in response to light source. There are two forms of the pupillary light reflex, the direct pupillary light reflex and the indirect or consensual light reflex, which is constriction of the other pupil in response to a source of light. Another commissural fibers, which is very important in the limbic system, are the fornices of the brain. The fornix is this structure. This is the fornix. It's located under the corpus callosum and separated from the corpus callosum by this system which is septum lucidum. So this is the fornix, and this is the corpus callosum. This is the corpus callosum. Corpus callosum is the largest commissural fibers of the brain, and the fornix uh, is separated on the medial side of the brain. It's separated from the corpus callosum by septum lucidum. Septum lucidum, this septum closes the cavity, which is the cavity of the lateral ventricle. So behind this septum, we will find a cavity called the lateral ventricle inside the brain. We have two fornices inside each cerebral hemisphere. So one inside each cerebral hemisphere. Each one consists, each one consists of anterior column, body, and crura sometimes called posterior column of the fornix. This is the other one. It has the same anatomical parts, anterior column, body, and crura. Crus is the single, and crura are the plural name. Between these two crura, we find this commissure, which is called fornix commissure, or sometimes we call it hippocampal commissure because it is related to the hippocampus. All these parts are related to the, the limbic system. The fornix itself are the efferent fibers of a structure called hippocampus. This structure here, which lies inside the parahippocampal gyrus on the tentorial surface of the brain, this structure is called hippocampus. The hippocampus sends efferent fibers. These efferent fibers collected, uh, are collected together to form the fornix or the posterior column or the crust of the fornix. Then both fornices arches uh, backward and upward forward to the anterior column. So this is the other fornix here and this is the other hippocampus which also give rise to the posterior crust of the fornix. Just in front of the fornix, it's good to see these rounded nuclei here, which are called amygdala. Amygdala are parts of limbic system and also basal nuclei. They have great function in the basal nuclei in controlling 
smell sensation. It lies, it lies with the structure inside the ancus on the tentorial surface of the brain. Corpus callosum. Corpus callosum is the largest commissural fiber of the brain as we mentioned before. Uh, it is situated, as you see here, on the medial surface of the brain or the medial, uh, this is the sagittal section of the brain which demonstrates parts of the corpus callosum. It lengths uh, approximately 10 cm uh, and it has four anatomical parts. It is connecting, um, it is connected, it connects all loops of the brain, the frontal loop, the parietal loop, the temporal loops, and occipital loops, except for the most anterior part of the temporal loops, which are connected by the anterior commissure, as we mentioned before. Okay, the corpus callosum is divided into four parts. The first part is called rostrum. This is the rostrum. The second part is called genu. This is the genu of the corpus callosum. And then the whole lens is called the body of the corpus callosum, which arches backward and forms rounded body, which is called a splenium. So this, the end part or the terminal part of the corpus callosum is called the splenium of the corpus callosum. The fibers which originates from the body of the corpus callosum connecting, uh, so let's discuss first the fibers which are originating from the genome of the corpus callosum. So this part is the anterior part of the corpus callosum, which is the genome of the corpus callosum. As you can see, it connects between both sides of frontal loops. These fibers which I am drawing here are called forceps minor. So forceps minor are the fibers which originates from the genome of the corpus callosum and connects both frontal loops of the brain. Also the fibers which originates from the back of the corpus callosum, here is the back of the corpus callosum, and are to connect both occipital loops, as you can see in this drawing, in the green color, are called forceps major. The rest of fibers which connects between the temporal and parietal loops are called tapetum of the corpus callosum. The orange color represents the tapetum of the corpus callosum, which originates from the body of the corpus callosum itself. So we have three different fibers from the corpus callosum. The forceps, the forceps minor, these fibers are the forceps minor connecting between the two frontal loops and forceps major which are connecting between the occipital loops and the rest of fibers are called tibetum of the corpus callosum and they are originating from the body and part of the splenium of the corpus callosum as well. The blood supply of the corpus callosum is very important. All parts of the corpus callosum are supplied by the anterior cerebral artery except the terminal part or the splenium which is supplied by an artery called posterior cerebral artery. We will discuss this in the section of the blood supply of the brain. The third type of the white fibers inside the brain are the projection fibers. They are either ascending, which are projecting towards the cerebral cortex, or descending, which are projecting from the cerebral cortex downward. The fibers which are projecting towards the cerebral cortex are called thalamic radiation. So thalamic radiation means fibers which are projecting towards the cerebral cortex because they are radiating from the thalamus. Thalamus is the largest sensory and relay station uh, of the uh, body 
uh, it lies inside the brain on the medial side of the cerebral hemisphere and it forms part in a lateral uh, part of la the lateral wall of the third ventricle as we will describe in the section of the dying cephalo. We have four types of this thalamic radiation. The first one is the sensory radiation. So the first one, this is the first one, the sensory radiation. Uh, the origin of these fibers are from the thalamus. Thalamus is subdivided into nuclei. The nucleus which is uh, which is lies uh, which lying uh, on the front of the thalamus is called anterior nucleus. The nucleus which lies on the back of the thalamus is called posterior nucleus. And we have two back nucleus, two sides of this back nucleus, either lateral or medial. So we have posterolateral and posteromedial nucleus of the thalamus. And also we have posterolateral ventral and posterolateral medial nuclei of the thalamus. So don't worry about these names. We will describe all these nuclei in the section of the thalamus. Uh, you have to just know that the sensory radiation the origin of this sensory radiation are from this nucleus, which is posterolateral ventral nucleus of the thalamus, to an area which is called 312. Of course, this is the area on the postcentral gyrus, which is the main sensory area of the brain, or the primary sensory area. <coughs> the second type of radiation is called anterior thalamic radiation. So this is the anterior thalamic radiation. It also originates from the anterior nucleus of the thalamus and projects to the cingulate gyrus. So this radiation from the anterior thalamic nucleus to the cingulate gyrus. The third one is the visual radiation. Visual radiations are projecting from a nucleus in the most posterior part of the thalamus called lateral geniculate body. It's projecting to the primary visual area 17 on the medial surface of the occipital loop. These fibers are included in the visual pathway. The last one is the auditory radiation. The auditory radiation also they are radiating from a nucleus in the most posterior part of the thalamus called medial geniculate body and projecting to the temporal loops of the brain in which we have the primary auditory area. So these fibers are included in the hearing pathway. Okay. The other type of projection fibers are the descending fibers from the cerebral cortex downward. These fibers uh, going downward from uh, the cerebral cortex to the spinal cord are called the pyramidal tract. So we have a tract which is very important in controlling fine movement and skilled movement called a pyramidal tract. You will take this uh, pyramidal tract in details on the section of the spinal cord. So to summarize the pyramidal tract, the origin of the pyramidal tract is from the cerebral cortex, from the precentral gyrus in the primary motor area four, and this pyramidal tract descend from this area down to the spinal cord. As it descend, it passes through the midbrain and the structures of the brain stem, so the midbrain and medulla oblongata, and then it's going to its final destination to the anterior horn cells uh, on the spinal cord to control fine motor and skilled movement. Okay, the other one is called extra pyramidal tract. So, extra pyramidal tracts. The origin of the extrapyramidal tracts are from the extrapyramidal centers of the brain 
which control coarse coordinated movement. As we have the premotor area 6 in front of the motor area 4. So premotor area 6 sends these projection fibers down to the spinal cord to control, for example, the muscles of uh, proximal parts of the trunks, proximal part of limbs and the muscles of the trunks. Uh, they also descend to the bones as corticobontine fibers. So this is another f uh, form of uh, projection fibers descending from the cortex, corticobontine. So this uh, fibers originates from the cortex down to the bones, the bones, which is the second part of the brain stem. Or lastly, corticothalamic fibers. Corticothalamic fibers, so they simply descend from the cortex down to the thalamus. So they end in the thalamus. What about the internal capsule? What types of fibers within the internal capsule? And what are the important anatomical parts of the internal capsule? And more importantly, the blood supply and lesions of the internal capsule. The internal capsule uh, is a V-shaped bundle of projection fibers. It appears on the horizontal section or in the coronal section of the brain. This is called horizontal section of the brain. This structure here is a horizontal section of the brain. We will discuss in details horizontal, coronal, and sagittal section in the practical session. So in the horizontal section of the brain, it appears as a V-shaped bundle uh, between something called codate nucleus and lentiform nucleus. What are the codate and lentiform nucleus? They both are nuclei of basal nuclei, the gray matter inside the brain. The basal nuclei will be discussed at the end of this lecture. The internal capsule is running between these two structures the codate and lentiform nucleus on the lateral side and of course the thalamus on the medial side of the brain. So where is the internal capsule on the horizontal section? This is the internal capsule. All these parts are forming uh, the internal capsule. Fibers of this internal capsule are continuous above as something called corona radiata. So the fibers of internal capsule continuous above with these fibers which have uh, like the, cor uh, the corona of the head. So it's called corona radiata. It's continuous above with these fibers. And continuous below with is the anterior part of the midbrain which is called trus cerebri. This is the anterior aspect of the midbrain, as you will see in the spinal cord. Okay, the internal capsule has anatomically five parts. The anterior limb, geno, and posterior limb, retrolentiform part, and this is the retrolentiform part on the other side, and sublentiform part, which is not obvious in all horizontal sections. To demonstrate the sublentiform part, you have to go beneath this level. It's important to know the types of fibers within each part of the internal capsule to identify the lesion. So the anterior limb of the internal capsule, anatomically, the anterior limb of the internal capsule lies between the caudate nucleus medially and the caudate nucleus medially and the lentiform nucleus laterally. This is the anterior limb of the internal capsule. It contains both descending and ascending fibers. This is this is the anterior limb of the internal capsule here. It contains both descending and ascending fibers. The descending fibers are called frontobontine, or sometimes we are calling them 
frontal pontal cerebellar this is the frontal pontine fibers so they are descending from the frontal loop of the brain to the pons and then ultimately to the cerebellum it's a very important uh, circle which includes uh, in the cerebellum this will be discussed in the cerebellum in the section of the cerebellum the ascending fibers they are called anterior thalamic radiation if you remember we have named these types of radiation before the anterior thalamic radiation is running from the anterior nucleus of the thalamus to the cingulate gyrus so this is the anterior thalamic radiation which includes which uh, are included in the anterior limb of the internal capsule and they are ascending fibers genome of the internal capsule this part here is the genome of the internal capsule it contains a very important part of the fibers it contains something called corticobulbar tract what is this tract Corticobulbar tract is a part of pyramidal tract. If you remember, we have mentioned the pyramidal tract origin from the precentral or motor area 4 in the frontal loop. Part of these fibers are descending only to the cranial nerve nuclei within the brain stem. So the brain stem is the origin for cranial nerves and these uh, cranial nerve have cranial nerve nuclei the nuclei lie inside the brain stem these fibers are targeting only to control the muscles which are innervated by the cranial nerves so for example the muscles of the face the muscles of the head so they are called corticobulbar tracts uh, the posterior limb of the internal capsule this part is the posterior limb of the internal capsule which lies anatomically between the salamus medially and this is the salamus medially and the lentiform nucleus laterally so the posterior limb of the internal capsule is this part here it contain also both ascending and descending fibers so if you divide the posterior limb of the internal capsule into two halves anterior half and posterior half and if you are describing the posterior the anterior half of the posterior limb of the internal capsule you will find here a very important fibers which descend to the spinal cord called the corticospinal or the pyramidal tract the corticospinal or the pyramidal tract and what about the ascending fibers which are ascending in the posterior limb of the internal capsule fibers which are calling uh, which are called the superior thalamic radiation the superior thalamic radiation ascends and uh, superior thalamic radiation is ascending in the posterior limb of the internal capsule uh, also they are called a uh, sensory radiation from the thalamus to the area 312 in the post central gyrus in the parietal loop okay we have also retro lentiform and sub lentiform parts of the internal capsule the retro lentiform part is situated behind the lentiform nucleus as we said in the horizontal section of the brain and the coronal section also sometimes it appears in the coronal section so this is the retro lentiform part Of the internal capsule as you can see it connects the lateral 
geniculate nucleus which is the nucleus in the most posterior part of the thalamus to the uh, visual area in the cerebral cortex which uh, is in the occipital loop of the brain so the optic radiation is an important pathway in the visual uh, system as it connects the lateral geniculate body which is the nucleus for vision in the thalamus with the cortex which is responsible for receiving the visual stimulus in the occipital loop on the opposite way the auditory radiation it connects the medial geniculate body the auditory radiation connects the medial geniculate body which also is a nucleus on the thalamus to the temporal loop of the brain if we are talking about the temporal loop so we are talking about the sense of hearing so it connects between the medial geniculate body and the temporal loop of the brain in the superior temporal gyrus which uh, includes the center of hearing this is the blood supply of the internal capsule it's very important to know the blood supply of each part of the internal capsule because if you know the blood supply if we have a, a hemorrhage uh, of the uh, blood supply so we have a condition called cerebral hemorrhage and this is very important condition because for example if you have cerebral hemorrhage in this limb which is the posterior limb of the internal capsule so the uh, fibers uh, which are running in this posterior limb will be affected which are controlling the corticospinal tract so the corticospinal tract is controlling uh, the uh, motor skilled movement or fine skilled movement of the opposite side of the body so you will end with a contralateral hemiplegia contralateral hemiplegia and of course we will discuss in details the blood supply of the internal capsule uh, within the section of the blood supply of the whole brain and spinal cord later on let's move to the other section which is uh, very important as well the basal ganglia what is the basal ganglia the human basal ganglia is a wrong name of course as you know the ganglia is a collection of nerve cells which lies outside the central nervous system but these basal nuclei this is the right name uh, lies inside the central nervous system so we better uh, call it uh, basal nuclei instead of basal ganglia طيب. what are the function of these basal nuclei the basal nuclei have the function of initiating voluntary movement so they initiate the movement and also they change the movement from one pattern to another let's say in dancing playing music or playing football they also important in controlling posture so if you think about dancing you keep changing your position while dancing or while playing football or while writing with a pen so the function of the basal nuclei uh, is shifting from one position or one movement to another in a smooth way you cannot feel it it's involuntary it's also very important to know that the basal nuclei are uh, only controlling motor activity they have no role in sensory activity or sensory uh, mediation of different uh, stimuli and they have no direct connection with the spinal cord or the brain stem nuclei so how they are working by a circuits inside the brain between the centers inside the brain these circuits uh, mediating some brain neurotransmitters which are excitatory either excitatory or inhibitory to the neurons and the overall action of the basal ganglia depends on these neurotransmitters and these circuits inside the brain okay uh, anatomists and physiologists 
divide the basal ganglia according to the earliest and latest part of discovery. Uh, they divide it into something called neostriatum. Neostriatum, this is the recent part of discovery, or sometimes they call it striatum. The striatum includes two parts, the putamen and caudate nucleus. The putamen and caudate nucleus. We will describe these parts uh, in the next slide. So what is the striatum? It includes two parts, putamen and caudate nucleus. The second part or the second division is the paleostriatum or pallidum. Pallidum includes only one part which is called globus pallidus. So if you are collecting both putamen and globus pallidus, you will go to the third one which is the lentiform nucleus. So the lentiform nucleus has two parts, lateral part called putamen and medial part called globus pallidus. The archistriatum, which is uh, the oldest part, is called amygdala or amygdaloid nucleus. Also, we have something called substantia nigra. Substantia nigra uh, is a part of the uh, midbrain and uh, subthalamic nucleus. The subthalamic nucleus is a part of a structure called subthalamus. This structure, of course, uh, is belonging to the dying kephalon, the thalamus family, and lastly, claustrum. Claustrum, uh, uh, we have mentioned this name before in the cortex, and it is known that the claustrum have no function, so it is of unknown function. Uh, this picture here demonstrates the uh, anatomical different parts of the basal nuclei. So this part here is the caudate nucleus. As we will see in next two slides, it has a head and body. And lastly, the tail of caudate nucleus, which ends with this structure here, the amygdala. So the tail of caudate nucleus is connected to the amygdala. Also, this part here, this part here is the lateral part of the lentiform nucleus, which is the putamen, and the medial part of caudate nucleus lies just medial to it, which is the globus pallidus. So this is the globus pallidus. So the caudate nucleus, head, body, tail, ends with the amygdala. And then, this is the amygdala here. And then uh, uh, the lentiform nucleus, which is divided into two parts. The lateral part, putamen, and medial part, globus pallidus. As you can see, we have some fibers which are connecting between the caudate nucleus and lentiform nucleus called caudato lentiform gray matter or gray bridge. This picture here shows the relation of the basal ganglia with the lateral ventricle. It's very important to know the relation between the basal ganglia and the lateral ventricle and we will discuss this picture in details with the section of the brain ventricles. Of course, this is the horizontal section, which is showing the basal nuclei and also the lateral ventricle. So if you remember, this structure here is the internal capsule. And of course, this will be the lentiform nucleus and this will be the caudate nucleus and this will be the thalamus. As you can see the three parts of the internal capsule, the anterior limb, the genome, the posterior limb of the internal capsule. This is the coronal section which shows the basal nuclei and also the lateral ventricle. 
so this is here this part here is the lentiform nucleus and this part here is the codate nucleus and this is the thalamus and this is the cavity of the lateral ventricle the anterior horn of the lateral ventricle and this cavity here between the two thalami uh, is of course the third ventricle this part here is the claustrum which is the lateral part of the basal nuclei and uh, just uh, it lies just medial to the insula this is the insula of the brain so uh, it of course has no function and uh, but it it is included in the parts of the uh, basal nuclei as we mentioned the caudate nucleus uh, is a major part of the striatum what are anatomical parts of the caudate nucleus uh, it's like uh, a c shaped letter so this is the caudate nucleus here it's forming c shape has a head this is the head and body and terminal part is the tail which joins the amygdala which contains the sense the center of the smell the head lies in the frontal loop and the tail lies in the occipital loop of the brain the amygdala lies in the ancus which is situated in the temporal loop in a structure uh, the ancus is situated in the most anterior part of the temporal loop on the tentorial surface of the brain the lentiform nucleus is a lens shaped nucleus consisting of two parts as we said before large lateral part which is called putamen and small medial part which is called globus pallidus so the lateral part is putamen the medial part is uh, globus pallidus in horizontal section or in coronal section the putamen appears dark and the globus pallidus appears pale so this uh, color or this striation gives the name of striatum because dark color and then pale color so it gives striated appearance so this is called striatum also the globus pallidus is divided into two parts lateral part and medial part or external segment of globus pallidus this is the external segment of globus pallidus and this small uh, dot is the internal segment of globus pallidus the lentiform nucleus which is this structure here lies between two capsules what are these two capsules this is the internal capsule as we mentioned before the internal capsule has the anterior limb genome posterior limb the anterior limb between the caudate nucleus and the uh, lentiform nucleus the genome between uh, all of them and the posterior limb between the thalamus and lentiform nucleus what is the second capsule the second capsule lies lateral to the lentiform nucleus which is this capsule this capsule is called external capsule so as you can see the lentiform nucleus lies between two capsules the blue one is the internal capsule and the green one is the external capsule and lastly the claustrum so the last part of the basal nuclei is the claustrum which has no function as we said and uh, it lies just medial to the insula the amygdala the amygdala lies in the ancus on the tentorial surface of the brain within the temporal pole it's connected with the tail of caudate nucleus as we mentioned before 
It's also good to know that the amygdala is a part of the limbic system of the brain as it plays an important role in the pathway of smell sensation. So it has two functions in the limbic system and in the basal ganglia for control voluntary motor activity. The substantia nigra. Substantia nigra lies in the midbrain anterior to the cerebral aqueduct. So this part here is the midbrain or uh, the cut surface of the midbrain and we have a structure called substantia nigra. This is the substantia nigra which is which has black color because of the pigmentation it contains. The pigment it contains, the melanin pigment it contains give the substantia nigra this name. Uh, it lies, as we said, in the uh, midbrain anterior to the cerebral aqueduct. The cerebral aqueduct is the central canal which lies inside the midbrain. And it plays an important role in the circuits of the basal ganglia. Lastly, the subthalamic nuclei. It's also part of the subthalamus. Subthalamus is a part of the dying kephalin. This is the subthalamic nucleus here. This is the thalamus. And this is the subthalamus. Three or four nuclei are collected together to form uh, the subthalamic uh, sub nuclei. Uh, they secrete glutamine neurotransmitter, and of course, this glutamine is an excitatory neurotransmitter for. Uh, motor activity. What about the connections of the basal nuclei? Uh, all afferent impulses are going to the caudate nucleus and putamen. Putamen is the large lateral part of the, of the lentiform nucleus. So they are forming together the corpus striatum. So all afferents are going to the corpus straight. And of course we know it, it is consisting of the caudate nucleus and putamen. All afferent, sorry, all efferent fibers are leaving from the globus pallidus. The globus pallidus is the medial part of the lentiform nucleus. So all afferents are going to the corpus striatum and efferents are leaving from the globus pallidus. And uh, here are some examples for afferent and efferent fibers which are going uh, towards the basal nuclei and leaving the basal nuclei to different parts of uh, the brain, including the brain stem and a uh, subthalamus. Uh, what about the circuits of basal nuclei? We have two detailed and confusing pathway uh, by which the basal nuclei are uh, controlling the voluntary motor activity. I think it is enough to know that we have two pathways, either direct pathway or indirect pathway. This is uh, this scheme here is representing the direct pathway and that one rep is representing the indirect pathway. This classification uh, is according to the parts of the basal nuclei which are sharing in the uh, circuit. For example, uh, in the indirect pathway, we have the subthalamic nucleus here. This is the indirect pathway. We have the subthalamic, so cortex, and then new striatum, and then globus pallidus, and then subthalamus, and globus pallidus, again to the thalamus, and finally to the cortex. So this is the indirect pathway. The direct pathway, we do not have the subthalamus in this circuit. Instead, we have 
this structure here with this the substantia nigra so it is not uh, important for you to know the details of the direct or the indirect pathway but it is important to know that the direct pathway is stimulatory to the cortex so the end result of the circuit is that the direct pathway stimulates the cortex or increase uh, the stimulation between the thalamus and the cortex. In the opposite way, the indirect pathway is inhibitory to the cortex. Don't worry about this plus here because uh, the end results of this pathway will inhibit the uh, voluntary motor activity. So if you have a lesion in the direct pathway, you may end with a disease which, uh, which uh, is called Parkinson's disease. This Parkinson's disease is characterized by something called hypokinesia. Hypokinesia means inability to initiate voluntary movement because the direct pathway is excitatory to the voluntary motor activity so if we have a lesion in this excitation so the end result will inability to initiate or produce a movement this is uh, uh, in a disease called parkinson's disease so the parkinson's disease is a lesion in the direct pathway which have both hypokinesia and also hypertonia and rigidity this rigidity because of simultaneous contraction of both flexors and extensors and it is very important to know that the parkinson's has something called resting tremors or tremors at rest vibration of uh, hands at rest this you have to um, identify something uh, else called intention tremors intention tremors uh, we will discuss this in the cerebellar disease and we have to differentiate between intention tremor and tremors at rest which is occurring in parkinson's disease as you can see the, this disease uh, happened to a very well known boxer called muhammad ali and here is the center which is named uh, by his name Muhammad Ali Parkinson Center uh, and he has this disability later on his life maybe because of has damage of basal ganglia because of boxing or something like this and the most important cause of the Parkinson's disease is the degeneration of the dopamine producing cells in the substantia nigra uh, uh, of the midbrain which uh, produce this disease uh, on the opposite side we have a hypo uh, sorry a hyperkinetic uh, disease uh, these diseases are occurring in the lesion of the indirect pathway as we mentioned before so the lesion of the indirect pathway produces a hyperkinetic diseases the very well known disease which is caused due to this lesion is called Huntington's disease or Huntington's chorea so the chorea is um, increased the unwanted movement this results from degeneration of the corpus striatum the caudate nucleus and the putamen uh, which end uh, which ends with continuous dance like movement uh, especially in the face and limbs we have another form of this hyperkinetic disorders which is called sedenum's chorea Sydenham's chorea is another form of chorea uh, which is resulted from rheumatic fever 
but uh, this uh, disease, this course of disease is transient and ends with full recovery after treatment of the cause. Lastly, we have hemibalismus. Hemibalismus is a flailing movement or sudden movement of one side of the body, one arm and one leg for example. This is caused by damage in the subthalamic nucleus. And you can see here, this is the, a photo or picture of Huntington's Korea. You can see the dance-like movement in the arm and legs. And this is another form of Korea, which is Sydenham's Korea, to care in young age due to rheumatic fever. And here is the hemibalismus. Hemibalismus is a sudden forceful movement in one side of the body, one arm and one leg. A normal basal ganglia circuit and uh, in Parkinson's disease and also in Korea. This, if you want to have more information about these circuits, um, please uh, refer to me and uh, it's not important for you to know the, de the details of the basal ganglia circuits and here we have reached the end of the lecture I hope you enjoyed it and uh, meet you again in another online lecture and thank you very much